And I just want to check and see, because I promised I would, are there any questions uh, from yesterday or the day before, or this just that have been in your mind relating to campaigns that you'd like to ask today? Just go ahead and put it in the check. Uh, chat box and we'll check on those. I think it is pretty cool. We got people from Canada and Puerto I know. Rico. Canada, that's, Puerto Rico. That's awesome. Very exciting. So any questions from the last couple of days, go ahead and type them in there now. And if not, that's okay too. There'll be time for questions at the end of the program today. Okay, St. Louis, Virginia, terrific. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started with today's icebreaker. And Kathleen's gonna be running that for us and then we'll move forward just like we have the last couple of days chronologically, leaving time for questions at the end. So Kathleen, here we go. And Kathleen, you're muted. There we go. You can hear me now? <laughs> yep. All right. Okay, so I wanted to make a quick icebreaker. I know we're putting a lot into these 90 minutes and we do wanna make sure that unlike yesterday that we do have time for questions at the end. Um, and questions can also be um, comments or ideas about how you're gonna use these resources in your classroom. So when I started asking panelists for information about their presidents, um, I heard, I got a lot of feedback um, that said, well, my president was the first to blank. And so we got into some semantic discussion. So I've got a lot of first in here. I have at least one last in here, but let's just uh, answer in the chat and I will tell you, all of the answers are somewhere between Hoover and Trump. Okay, so all of the answers to these questions, not that each of these presidents will be an answer to a question, but that no other presidents will be an answer to a question. Does that make sense? We ready to go? It's the lightning round. First televised presidential debate. What year? What year do you think that was? Or who do you think the people debating? All right, not everyone at once. 1960, 1960, 62, 60, Nixon, Kennedy. So, oh, wait. Okay, we're getting closer. Okay, so according to the internet, so you know that it's right, um, the first televised presidential debate was actually 1956 with um, Eleanor Roosevelt representing uh, Adelaide Stevenson and Senator from Maine, Senior Senator, Senator from Maine, uh, Margaret Chase Smith representing Eisenhower. So how interesting is that? There were women representing these different presidential candidates. It was filmed and then shown on television. All right, who was, who of those presidents, who appeared on the first television broadcast? I'll give you a hint, he wasn't president at the time. Scroll down in the chat. All right, Mindy, was your answer Hoover? Leslie Hoover? Okay, that is correct. Hoover was on television. Elizabeth, make sure I get this date right. 1927? Yes, 1927. And he was the Secretary of Commerce at the time? Yes, he was. All right. All right, which president? Uh, established joint press conferences with foreign leaders. Prior to this president, it was typically a one-on-one, -on -one, it was just the president doing a press conference. FDR, FDR, 
Carter, we're getting closer. Think more recent, more recent. Nixon, Reagan, Nixon. It's actually George H.W. Bush. George H.W. Bush established the, um, the idea of a joint press conference, that being a thing that, that people do. And just so you know, when I say these answers came from the internet, um, legitimate sources, New York Times, White House Historical Association, the, um, oh, the presidency project that UVA does. All right. Who held, which president held the first televised press conference? First televised press conference. Thoughts? Are y'all getting tired of these questions already? All right, Eisenhower. Yes, Eisenhower. Eisen, Eisenhower held the first televised press conference. Which president, which, which president was the first to have impeachment proceedings, televised impeachment proceedings? Nixon, it's not Clinton. I thought it would be Clinton, but it was Nixon. Actually, PBS, um, this is way before C-SPAN, PBS broadcast all just straight the, the, the House and the Senate for Nixon. All right, first president to appear on television as president. So we know that, yes, FDR, FDR. All right, the quicker you answer, the quicker we get through. We're making it through to lucky Number 13, who was the first president to deliver a presidential address during prime time? Prime time. It's not Eisenhower. It's a president that we've already used his name once. It's not Reagan. It's a little bit further back. We're so close. It's actually Nixon again. Nixon was the first president to deliver a presidential address during prime time. All right, first president to make a televised presidential address. So this is different from FDR being the first president to appear on television. This is actually a president giving a presidential address, televised presidential address. Truman, that is correct. That is correct. First president to deliver a weekly radio address. FDR, FDR, first president to hold a live press conference, a live televised press conference. JFK, y'all are getting good at this. Last president to deliver a weekly radio address. Who was the last president? Trump, Trump is right. He did it at the beginning of his administration and then he stopped. Um, Please tell me you know the answer to 12. First televised presidential assassination attempt. And it, should, I, it shouldn't say to be shot on television. It should say to be shown, shown on television. That is Reagan. So interesting, you could make an argument for JFK, but the event where Ra the assassination attempt of Reagan was an event that was, that was already being filmed by television and so like that day, that minute, it was shown over and over and over again from that footage. All right, and first president to de deliver a televised State of the Union address. One last, it's not Truman, I think a little bit later. LBJ, absolutely right. So icebreaker television, um, presidents have used television in different ways. Um, you're going to hear from our panelists today about other um, media, I, I should say radio and television because there are questions about both. Um, so different ways of different mechanisms of communicating and different target audiences. So I think as we have been all week, we will start with the lovely Elizabeth. Take it away. I'll quit sharing my screen so you can. Oh, it's all right. Mine's going to pop up here. All right. There we go. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I feel like this was an appropriate picture to use today. Uh, Hoover, you know, people kissing babies, but Hoover's handing a crying baby back to somebody. So 
We'll take that for what it is. <laughs> so who but Hoover, this is one of his campaign slogans. Um, it appeared on a lot of different things. Um, and so we're gonna talk about some things. Um, campaigning was a lot different in 1928 than you think of now. The logistics to organize a single campaign speech was enormous. Um, there wasn't commercial flights you could just hop onto to fly across the country, and trains took a pretty long time to move. Um, also, Hoover was not a great orator. You'll see a speech from him in a little bit, and he just, he didn't really feel the audience, and he would have awkward pauses, and he didn't really, like, energize the crowd. Um, his speeches were fairly monotone. He's not particularly quotable, and we say that a lot. And then when I was in the National Archives in Washington, D.C., the back of the archives magnet is a quote from Hoover when he laid the cornerstone for the archives. So I guess we're eating our words now. Um, he had whistle stops all over the country, uh, much like Truman, and that's what one of these pictures are that are on here. And it really gave him the opportunity to be succinct and direct in his policy proposals because his speeches tended to be a little bit long-winded um, and people responded really well to them. So here we can see some of the pictures from some of his whistle stops. You can see just how many people were actually showing up for these whistle stops. And some of the feedback that he got from this was that they didn't have an electric um, loudspeaker. So a lot of people showed up and then they couldn't hear Hoover speak. Hoover ran the first campaign commercials and this is really a weird thing. Uh, there was a company called Transport Publicity Corps and it created a fleet of trucks that showed that silent film I talked about on the first day called Master of Emergencies all over the country. And I'm gonna show you guys a quick clip of Master of Emergencies here because it gives you an idea of what people were watching off the backs of these trucks. And so the, I picked this clip because it starts off them talking about him being the great humanitarian. Um, and the buzz about this film is that people were weeping on the streets while they were watching it and they just fell in love with Hoover and all these things that he did and it uh, shared his story all over the country and people would gather around kind of like an ice cream truck to, to see this. And he talks, they talk about food will win the war and it just goes on and on and on. It's kind of like reading a novel, but it's got some really interesting footage and it had never been done before. So the other thing I wanted to show you guys too is Hoover's first television address because this is a really cool part of history and it was one of the reasons that Hoover was so popular. 7th, 1927, the telephone was 51 years old. In a New York auditorium, a handful of... Hmm. I think maybe my internet is uh, going a little bit too slow for it. It is on the Wet Hoover Facebook page. Um, you can find it there and, and watch it. But it just shows him on this first television broadcast in New York and what was going on uh, with what that looked like. So we're going to talk about the Southern strategy in 1928. And this is something that's probably not studied enough or talked about enough, at least in my opinion, because it's a really important part of, um, of what's happening in the 1928 election. So the Republican Party deploys this strategy that had been used before called the Southern strategy. And their goal was to replace African-American lawmakers and replace white equality lawmakers with more moderate status quo candidates. And this became more broadly known as a lily white tactic. Um, and they were doing this so they could capture those Southern Democrats. Hoover carried Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Florida, Kentucky, Oklahoma, and Texas, all Democratic states. And it was the first time the Republican Party had carried them since Reconstruction. The Southern strategy boasted a policy of status quo on prohibition, race and prosperity. Um, and of course, this is problematic for a lot of reasons if you think about what's going on in 1928. Al Smith calls to bring back arguments about who the KKK supports. The influence of the KKK was waning up until this point. 
Um, the Republican Party used this opportunity to show black voters that Republicans were the better choice and to remind them that Southern Democrats had founded the KKK and still aligned with them. These were dirty attack tactics by both candidates. And so I want to show you guys here, this is one of the press releases um, that came from the Hoover Curtis campaign. And they're talking about how Alfred Smith is trying to revive um, the influence of the Ku Klux Klan. And they use some pretty um, very big language here. They talk about them being bigots and like all of the bad things that the KKK was and that bringing this into the campaign was disastrous for the country. And so at the end of this letter here, or at the end of this press release here, um, they talk about how Hoover is going to be this vindication of, of that, and um, he's going to be this symbol of humanitarianism, equality, and religious liberty. And then they say towards the Smith campaign, this is an unworthy, short-sighted, and unwise campaign trick. So they're already identifying themselves as playing dirty campaign games, I guess. So in 1928, we're running on this idea of the most popular man in the world. And Hoover wanted this glorious economic system to have more community responsibility. He believed in rugged individualism and altruism and that people had to do for themselves and that rich people should feel a duty to help out poor people. He wanted a moralized marketplace. He was really committed to trying to banish poverty, which of course we know is going to be difficult in the future, and he promised to enforce prohibition. Smith attempted to convince voters that a democratic victory would not compromise the prosperity they had enjoyed under Harding and Coolidge. Um, he also emphasized the evils of prohibition and bigotry. Um, they're trying to disassociate themselves with um, entities like the KKK, and then also say that prohibition actually brought about a rise of organized crime when it's making society amoral. So these are Hoover's speeches in 1932. He gave 12 major speeches and several whistle, whistle stops. And I want to show you guys a clip from um, one of the campaign clips. This is actually really cool. I wonder if Jeff has seen this actually. It's it's one of my favorite campaign videos. They're actually running trains into each other. I feel like this is a very uh, expensive campaign stunt. and <laughs> Probably pretty dangerous too. Um, this is Des Moines. Um, you can see, obviously, Hoover was the golden child of Iowa, and they're rolling into one of his speeches that he gave in 32 here. And then it's going to cut to the Madison Square Garden speech. Concerned in dealing with the problems of these times, while fighting to save our people from chaos and to restore order in our economic life has been to avert hunger or cold amongst those upon whom the blows have fallen with heartbreaking severity, that is our unemployed workers. I assure you that this country is not to blame for the catastrophes that have come to the world. The American people did not do it. understand how to read the crowd. Um, they're trying to applaud at something he said, and he just talked over them. Um, he just was not a very polished politician, even at this point in 1932. And so that really kind of shows through in this campaign of 32. He wasn't a good politician. He was just a great administrator. Um, and that idea of rugged individualism comes up again. And he's against moving relief around and he kept up with that faith in the gold standard, which we talked about yesterday. But eventually he ended up abandoning a lot of the things that he really had a fundamental belief in to try to save the economy. Um, and I think this happens a lot in presidential decision making. Um, having ideals are very different than solving problems. And sometimes presidents have to 
um, back out of things that they really believe in in order to solve problems because that's immediate. And we talked about that the other day when we said, well, how are people not getting elected on things that aren't their fault? Well, like Hoover, if you stick to this idea of rugged individualism during the Great Depression, it looks like you're not handling this disaster very well at all. So it really shows up in these campaigns that you didn't do anything, you held on to this belief of rugged individualism when we needed you to solve our economic crisis. And so that really um, comes out. He also started the a lot of the public works things that uh, ended up rolling into the 30s, and he really did start to lay the foundations for the New Deal, which is mind blowing to think about. Um, but they had already listed public works projects like the Golden Gate Bridge, the Hoover Dam, the Tennessee Valley Authority, and talked about how those public works projects could generate money on their own. So Roosevelt, and this is what I was kind of hinting at yesterday, Paul Conklin said, with no clear understanding of himself, of economic realities, or even the hazards that he would soon face, he was still supremely available and appealing. Um, he did not have the substance, the wisdom for great leadership. He never did, but he had the form. And in 1932, the form seemed more important than the substance. And that was that thing I was talking about where like there was a lot left to the American public's imagination that he would do these things that he never actually said he would do. It was kind of left up to people to decide. So in the interest of time, I've kind of compartmentalized the target audience for campaign literature. The general public could really be anybody, but when you look at it, it really targets kind of waspy white men. Um, women were a growing demographic and they'd overwhelmingly supported the Republican Party, so there's a lot of literature geared towards them. And then there's um, African American voters, and they had largely been loyal to the Republican Party, but 1932 is when we start to see this disaffection of African American voters across the country. They start to leave the Republican Party of Lincoln and move to the Democratic Party of FDR. And I say the Democratic Party of FDR because it's not the same Democratic Party that is coming out of 1928, the Southern Democrats, like we were talking about Strom Thurmond and the Dixiecrats. That's not FDR's Democratic Party. It's, it's this new party. Um, I put in the folder for you guys, there's some articles about how um, African American voters started to move from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party during Hoover's time and some of the things that led up to it. So you guys can definitely um, take a look at that. So for the general public here, I'm going to pull this over and show you what some of the tactics that they used. And all of this stuff will be in the folder for you guys. They liked to compare Hoover and Smith and in this really weird way. So if you look here, you can see they're talking about where they went to college, what their religion is, how old when they, were they when they lost their father and their mothers and their salaries and where their wives went to school. And it's just really weird. And they really attack um, Smith for being Catholic is the really big thing that they go after him on. They also um, go after him for his Tammany Hall co uh, connections. And this is another one of those press releases where they're talking about the influence of Tammany Hall and how it's going to corrupt uh, American politics. I think, yes. So the next group I want to look at, and this is one of my favorite pictures, is uh, women and Hoover. Uh, the stuff they put out for women voters is interesting. So they just have this literature that targets women. What has the Republican Party done for women? Um, they talk about suffrage. Voting was still new for women. They talk about giving them high offices and services of women. And now this pamphlet's actually written for Black women. And they go through and talk about all these talking points about what the Republican Party has done for Black women. And then this last group is African Americans. And I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about how they affected um, some of the outcomes here. The Black voters were angry by 1932. Um, they were disproportionately affected by the Great Depression. And Hoover had set up all of these economic committees and unemployment relief committees. And he did not appoint a single African American person to any of these committees. 
The NAACP is writing all of these letters to Hoover. We have these qualified people from these cities that are super affected by the Great Depression. Please put them on the committee so that they can help you understand what's going on. And these letters never, never made it past Hoover's secretary. And it's a huge political fumble. Like Truman says, the buck stops here. Even though Hoover may not have been like overtly racist about this, he still is blamed for it because he was the president and he should have been aware of what letters were coming into his secretary. Um, one of the other things that's happening is he just, he said he was gonna follow that status quo um, law uh, rules like to get the Southern Democrats. So they weren't going to go against racial policies, which means Jim Crow and lynching. And the silence is resounding. Black publications across the country are saying, Hoover's not protecting us from lynching. Hoover's not helping us in our poor cities. Hoover isn't fighting Jim Crow laws and trying to help us earn civil rights. And this all affected the image of not just Hoover, but what they saw as a changing Republican party. Hoover did have a trusted advisor, uh, Robert Moton. He was an educator at the Tuskegee Institute and he had been advising Hoover since before he was president. And he put a lot of stock in what Richard had to say. I'm sorry, Robert, what Robert had to say. But I do wanna look at real quick, in 1932, when this is apparent, this is happening, they invite a bunch of people from the Tuskegee Institute and Hoover gives this talk about how he's gonna help um, support rights for um, African-Americans. And he talks about being the party of Lincoln. But like with our students, look at this date. It's October 1st, 1932. It is over. One of the only places Hoover earned more votes than he did in 28 was in Chicago. And that's where um, DePriest's um, district was. And DePriest um, campaigned really hard for Hoover because his wife got an invitation to the White House. And then after this, Articles ran all over the country talking about this speech that happened at the White House with African American men at the White House, and it did not go well for the Southern Democrats. It really made them mad. Um, remember, they they were at that time the founders of um, the KKK and, and racial policies. So that is what I have for you guys today. I could talk about this all day, but. Um, Jeff, I'm sure, wants to talk. I feel like I just cover 1932 for Jeff, and then he just gets to pick up in uh, the next election. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Um, as always, I, you know, the, the problem with Roosevelt is he's got the four elections. You know, sometimes I, I go to sleep at night wishing I worked for uh, the Ford Library, where you know you only had the one election in the two years of actually being president. Um, but uh, I think the, the overarching theme that I want to talk about in terms of uh, Roosevelt and the campaign and communication and those sorts of things is this idea of um, image management. And, um, you know, Roosevelt um, was, was a master at, at crafting and maintaining uh, uh, an image. And, um, you know, the, he had this image of a winner, you know, and again, comparing that to Hoover, who was a great guy, but just not a dynamic guy, and just not a guy that, that instilled a whole lot of uh, sense of, of confidence and such. Um, and so what happens is, uh, you know, Roosevelt comes in and he creates this, this um, I don't want to say illusion, but he, he create, creates this, this uh, impression that he's a man on the go. And he's a man that's going to make things happen. And he's a man that's going to get things uh, hopping again. And this was very interesting, considering the fact that he's doing from a wheelchair. Now, um, you know, you can't talk about Roosevelt and his accomplishments and his presidency without, um, you know, venturing into the uh, to the polio um, uh, situation that he had. Everybody knew he had polio. Um, that was not a secret. Um, and Time Magazine had run a big article on it um, in, uh, in 32. And uh, everybody knew that he had polio. But what they didn't know was how severely it impacted him. He was not able to walk. He literally had to be lifted in and out of bed um, in the morning and at night. Um, he would um, you know, relieve himself at the desk uh, because it was too difficult for him to get back and forth to the bathrooms and things once he, um, he became president. So everybody knew that he had polio, but it was, it was a matter of 
of how much it had um, impacted uh, and affected him. Now, in the 32, leading up to the 32 campaign, as Elizabeth said, um, you know, there were some demographic changes, especially with African Americans, and they began to move um, from the south into the, to the, uh, uh, into the cities in the north. And Roosevelt was one of the first people to recognize um, this as a potential, um, you know, tappable voting uh, block. And so what Roosevelt did was he ingratiated himself to um, Democrats in the cities and the African American communities that were beginning to develop there. But he also ingratiated himself to the county courthouses and the county, um, you know, uh, country houses where um, the country Democrats were uh, as well. And this is the beginning of um, what um, Elizabeth was talking about, the new Democrats, the new Democratic uh, coalition, the Roosevelt coalition. And by Roosevelt doing this, it said that he could uh, draw, uh, you could draw a, take a pencil and draw a line across anywhere across the United States and Roosevelt would be able to tell you who the county Democratic commissioner was in each of those counties, um, no matter where you drew that line. And this was because he spent a lot of time uh, cultivating these relationships, either personally or through the help of Eleanor and uh, his campaign staff. Um, he campaigned in 32 in 41 states. He insisted on campaigning in 41 states because uh, in part he wanted not to take a victory lap, but he wanted to go out and um, thank the folks that had uh, support, that were supporting him, you know, the, 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 uh, the Democrats in the cities and the folks um, in, the, in the countries, uh, in the country. And of course, you know, he did this in a way um, that was very much positive, very upbeat, but again, um, short on particulars. Um, and Roosevelt presented himself as, as kind of two people. On the one hand, he was a fancy guy, right? He's this New York rich, aristocratic Hudson Valley, you know, big shot, um, you know, part of the Roosevelt clan and everybody still had the, you know, the, the good feeling, warm, fuzzy feeling uh, from Teddy Roosevelt left over. Um, but he also was folksy. You know, he was also a guy that could, um, could sit down and talk with you, you know, man-to-man, uh, one-to-one, -to -one, person to person. And this was a, a technique he honed here in Dutchess County when he ran for the state Senate. Uh, Dutchess County is a very Republican county, uh, always has been and still is. And um, he would, uh, he campaigned in his Senate, uh, his state Senate campaign on the um, eastern part of the county, which was highly, highly, uh, and still is, uh, Republican. And he went out there and he bought, uh, he actually rented, not bought, a, a little red roadster. And he would drive around to all the rural communities. And when he saw a farmer coming along, you know, with a horse and, and wagon, he would pull the car over to the side and um, he would turn it off and wait for the par farmer to approach and then he would engage him in a, in a conversation. And the farmer saw this as a great sign of respect because of course the, you know, the car would have, would have um, you know, jostled the horses and they would have ended up starting off with, with milk and ending up with you know, cottage cheese by the time they got to the market. Um, and Roosevelt was, uh, had this common touch. You know, here's this fancy guy driving this fancy car, but he's got a respect enough for what I do as a little old farmer guy to, um, to turn this thing off and, and allow me to approach him. And um, he, uh, he wins out there because uh, he goes out and he talks to these farmers and they say, well, you know, you're wasting your time out here, Sonny. You know, we're all Republicans and we're not gonna go for some, you know, crazy Democrat from the other side of the county. And Roosevelt would ask him a simple question. When was the last time you had a discussion like this with your uh, Republican representative? You know, and they'd scratch their head and they'd say, well, gee, now that I think about it, never. And Roosevelt said, that's right, um, because they're not looking after you the way I am. I'm here to find out what you want, what you need, and, you know, and let me, um, you know, serve you uh, in, in Albany, which is our state capital. So he begins to put together that, that New Deal um, program. Now, interestingly enough, and just to give you an idea of uh, Dutchess County politics, Roosevelt wins the presidency four times. And there is this big uh, Roosevelt Home Club, which uh, here is a little, uh, you know, button and, and ribbon from the home club. And um, whenever President Roosevelt or candidate Roosevelt would be in Dutchess County, there'd be this huge picnic um, and uh, everybody would come out and everybody would slap them on the back and say, oh yeah, you're gonna do it, don't worry. Oh yeah, we got you here, we got you back. And yet he never once carried Dutchess County. So everybody came out for the hot dogs and the ice cream, but when it came time to vote, Dutchess County never uh, voted for, um, for Roosevelt. 
So Roosevelt begins to build this, this coalition, um, um, New York City, uh, not necessarily New York City, but uh, city Democrats, uh, country Democrats, uh, African Americans who are moving into these areas. Um, and he begins to court them and begins to um, show again signs of respect. Now, by now today's standards, it probably wouldn't be seen as enough, but he has what's called a black cabinet, right? A group of, of African American uh, advisors who he, he turns to uh, for advice. He appoints uh, a record number of African Americans to um, government posts. Um, he gets the backing of, of labor workers. He gets the backing of um, uh, farmers. He gets the backing of uh, Southern Democrats. He gets the backing of, and, and part of the, the reason he gets the backing of the Southern Democrats is that he tempers his approach to, um, to solving African American problems uh, so as not to upset you know, the, the more conservative whites uh, Democrats uh, in the South. So again, this idea of, of image um, management, and this leaves some people with the sense that you, know, you really can't trust Roosevelt because you, know, you don't really know who you're dealing with when you're dealing with this guy. Um, you know, he's a bit deceptive, but, um, and, I, and I'd like to deny that, but it's, it's, it's true. He, um, he knew how he needed to um, persuade himself, and as Mark said yesterday you know, uh, with Truman, um, you know, when he was talking to farmers, he, he uh, played up his farmer. Uh, credentials. When he was talking to veterans, he played up his, his veteran credentials, and Roosevelt uh, did exactly um, that same thing. Now, um, in 1944, when he runs, he's very, very sick. In fact, he lives just 83 days into the fourth term. And so this, as Mark showed yesterday, a kind of a rare photo of, of uh, President Truman in color. This is a, a rare photo of FDR in color. And you can see, look at those beautiful blue eyes, right? Puts Frank Sinatra to shame. And this was a campaign picture that was taken in August um, of 1944. And it was taken in color because it, thought that it was thought that the president looked better in color. He's very sick here. In fact, he's going to die um, in the following April. So this is the, the picture that is put out to show how young and vigorous and good looking and still he can do the job. And yet, this is the picture uh, from April. So you've got, here's what he looks like in August. Here's what he looks like in April. This picture was taken just the day before um, he, uh, he passed away. Um, during that 44 campaign, he uh, pledged to do a um, sweep through New York City. And it was uh, something like a 53 mile trip. And he was going to go through all the boroughs of New York and then back into Manhattan. And this was in October, um, just before the election. And the day of the, the, the big uh, parade or the big campaign sweep happened to be a very cold, bitter, rainy day. So what they did was they set up little safe houses in the various boroughs. And um, you know, the president rode in an open car for almost six hours. Um, and you know he's waving to everybody. They came out in the rain and he's getting drenched. And then um, they take them around the corner and they pop them into one of these safe houses. They give him a little brandy to get a little more color in his face, a little more ro uh, rosy cheeks. Um, they would change his clothes so he would be you know, dry and warm again and they would get him on the next uh, length of the, of the trip. And so again, somewhat deceptive, just you know, polishing up this image as you went from borough to borough to borough, but everybody saw a fresh dynamic um, you know, Roosevelt that was uh, ready um, to take office. In terms of technology, one of the biggest things that Roosevelt uh, did was he used the um, predominant technology of the time, which was radio. Now, when Elizabeth showed that uh, speech a few minutes ago of, of Herbert Hoover, you don't often hear Herbert Hoover giving speeches. I thought he was doing quite well. Um, you know, he did kind of step on his applause there a bit. But um, you know, if he had used the radio more often, I think um, he would have been more effective. But Roosevelt came on and he gave these fireside chats and he was folksy and he addressed everybody as my friends. And you know, here he is, this big fancy, you know, um, you know, New England, New York, you know, uh, rich guy, and yet he's you know addressing people um, as uh, as my friends. The fireside chats were very important because they um, humanized Roosevelt to the people. And over the course of his presidency, he gave uh, 29 uh, fireside chats. They lasted on average about a half an hour. They were um, given at 10 o'clock Eastern time. And that was because that was back where the population was in the country at the time on the East Coast and the West Coast. So if it was 10 o'clock 
uh, on the East Coast, you could get the kids in bed and listen unbothered, and you could have the kids uh, having dinner and doing homework or playing in the yard on, on the West Coast. And the, the uh, um, formula that he used for the, the fireside chats was basically three parts. State the problem, present the solution, and then have it ask for what he wanted people to do. So he gets on there, hey, we're having a banking crisis. As everybody knows, the banks are going under left and right, blah da 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 um, You know, that's the problem. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to shut the banks down for a week, and then at the end of the week, we're going to open up the solvent ones, um, and, you know, you can put your money back in. So we're going to go through. The bank examiners will come in. Once the banks are secure, we'll open them up again, and then what I need you to do is to put the money back in. And so the way this worked was, you know, he would present the problem, present the solution, and then uh, put the ask in. And then over the next couple of weeks, letters and, and uh, cables and, and uh, telegrams and, and uh, phone calls would pour into the White House, and he would get a sense of how he was doing and where he was um, going uh, in terms of um, public support. So as a good leader, he would never get too far out in, in front of, uh, of folks. Um, and, you know, uh, that caused him some problems um, in, a, in a couple of places, you know, particularly um, the anti-lynching, you know, legislation. You know, a lot of people th thought he should have done that, but um, he didn't feel he had the support um, of the Southern Democrats, which he believed he needed in order to get the rest of his New Deal uh, programs uh, put into place. As I said, he um, did all this from a wheelchair, and there are only five known pictures of Franklin Roosevelt in a wheelchair. We have four of them in our collection. This is one of them, and this is him sitting uh, on the porch at Top Cottage, his retirement house, and he's sitting in the wheelchair. He's got Fala on his lap, and this is the daughter of one of the people uh, who works for him. So this was an intimate picture taken by her little girl, uh, Lucy Vi's mother. And so, um, you know, that's why Roosevelt felt comfortable having this taken. But the unwritten rule was you never took a picture of the president um, looking disabled. And so we know of only five photographs uh, taken of the, of the president. And one of them, believe it or not, was found just about eight or nine years ago. There was a little girl in Pennsylvania who was a big procrastinator and needed to bring something in for um, show and tell. And she waited to the last minute and, um, you know, she finally she said to her mother, I don't know, what, what should I do? What should I bring in? And she said, I don't know, you know, why don't you go ask Granny? So she asked Granny and Granny said, well, you know, Poppy's got an old trunk up in the attic. Go up there and see if you can find something. So the little girl goes up, she digs through the, um, through the trunk and she finds um, a photograph of Franklin Roosevelt in a wheelchair. It was the third known photograph. And it was actually taken by her grandpa who was at a naval base when FDR was brought there. Um, he took the picture, uh, which was against regulations, and he hid it in his uh, attic for the next 75 or 80 years. The little girl discovered it, brought it out to the world. Um, we now know it as the third photograph of FDR in the wheelchair. And if I'm not mistaken, she won the Nobel Peace Prize for um, show and tell that year, that little girl. So, so that was good. Um, and FDR, um, you know, would uh, not generally travel in the wheelchair. And here's a little model. He would. Uh, this is a wheelchair he designed himself because he wanted maximum flexibility and mobility. So you'll notice it's nothing more than a kitchen chair that the legs have been cut off of. It's placed on a metal frame with the big wheels in the front and the little wheels um, in the back. And you notice that there's no arms on here. That is because polio is a um, muscle disease, not a nerve disease. So when the president sat, he was basically sitting on his butt bone. Um, his, his butt muscles had atrophied. So he was basically sitting on his spine. So he would use this to get from point A to point B and then slide more comfortably, um, you know, either into a column or into a more comfortable seat. And then uh, over here, we also show um, this round thing, which is not a drink holder. It is in fact an ashtray because the president was a big time smoker He's dead. So keep that in mind. We always pass that on uh, to the kids. So the idea here is to manage the image. You know, whether you are, you know, Dr. Um, New Deal, you know, sweeping through, being all very active and, you know, getting things going, you know, to, to underscore this, this activity uh, image, he, uh, as, as um, Elizabeth mentioned, 
he flew in an airplane to Chicago, right? Which was something that um, generally people just didn't do back in those days. Thirty-two, uh, flying around is not a um, you know widespread thing for uh, for most people. So this was like dynamic, you know, uh, for this guy. Wow, look at this energy! This guy is flying in here, you know, just like out of the blue. Um, and that was the image that he wanted to put forth. And then of course, when the war comes along, you know, um, it's uh, the image is Doctor Win the War, and you know this idea of leadership, the idea of steady course, the idea of moving forth and moving through. The last thing I want to leave you with is a little current connection, which I sometimes get in trouble for pointing out, but I want to point this out because I think it's very important. And, you know, a lot of people make um, uh, a lot of hay out of, you know, President Trump tweeting. Oh, President Trump tweets, President Trump tweets. Well, in a lot of ways, President Trump's tweets are very much like Franklin Roosevelt's fireside chats because Roosevelt used the radio to talk directly to the people who supported him, putting out his ideas, putting out what he wanted them you know, to do, putting out the ask. Here's the problem, here's the way I see it, here's what I want you to do about it. Roosevelt did it with fireside chats over the course of 25 minutes. President Trump does it with tweets with 144 characters. But in many ways, it's the same thing. You're using the predominant technology. Radio was like 25 or 20 years old at the time, as is you know, the technology to tweet. And so Trump is using this to talk directly to his followers, just as Roosevelt was talking directly to his followers in an attempt to influence them and to get them to, um, to respond and react in a way that he wanted them to. Now, you could go on and on and argue about the you know, the content and the quality and all the rest of that stuff, but that's not what we're here to do. So that's Roosevelt, master image manager. Fancy and folksy, you make the call. Over to Mark. Thank you, Jeff. You know, when we said to this, I hadn't realized that I was gonna have to follow Jeff three days in a row. Um, <laughs> and we've got stories about when we've done that before back in the, the LBJ library and other presentations we've done together. But thank you, Jeff, that was great. And actually, I'm gonna use a couple of things that I didn't intend to use. But while Jeff was talking, I did a little bit of internet searching on trumanlibrary.gov to pull up a couple of things to make a nice segue. So let me see if I can get the magic of the technology to work. and show you this photo. Can everybody see that? Give me a thumbs up, Jeff, if you can see that photo. Yep. Perfect. So this is, uh, this is Jeff's guy. FDR, and this is in February of 1945 at the Yalta Conference with Winston Churchill, who Truman is going to meet in July at the Potsdam Conference. Um, but this just look look at FDR in this photo in terms of what Jeff was talking about before in terms of the health of FDR, and of course he he dies in April, and this is just a couple of months before when he's meeting with with Churchill. So I thought I would pull that up. Um, and it'll come back to me. That was not part of the presentation. So that was bonus, bonus coverage there. Um, and if you want to look at some of those photographs on quick plug for TrumanLibrary.org, we've got close to 60,000 photographs digitized that you can look at. And we've just improved the uh, search capability on those two. So let me jump into my uh, real presentation. Um, and I'm also going to try and show you some uh, video footage as well uh, a little bit later on that we have of Truman that's recently been digitized of his campaign. Um, so our theme today has been communications. And I showed this photo earlier in the week just because it's one of my favorite photos. And um, it's so rare to have such a great color photo of Truman. But again, it comes back to this communication. And the other segue to Jeff's presentation is this idea of talking directly to the people. And rather than the radio and rather than television, which we'll talk about a little bit later on with Truman, is that as you well know, um, he's most famous for in 1948 is his whistle stop campaign where he travels around the country, going to all of these towns. And it isn't just talking from the back of the train, that's what it's most known for. But in the larger towns on that campaign trips, he goes then into the cities and does parades out of an open top car and then into city halls and community centers and sports arenas and makes large addresses in the evening talking directly to the people. So that's kind of what we're going to be looking about um, with this uh, short presentation uh, on Truman and the 48 campaign. 
Um, so this is uh, one of the trains that was used. You're probably familiar with the, the Ferdinand Magellan at the back of the, the, back of the, uh, the train. And this is probably one of the most iconic photos that you might see. And all of these photos are from um, trumanlibrary.gov. And of course, as I mentioned the previous couple of days, on many of these legs of his journey, the family goes with him. He just has the one daughter. Margaret's with him, his daughter. She's born in 1924. And then Bess, his wife, the first lady, accompanies him over well. They don't usually speak, but he always introduces them and they get a huge ovation. Now, what happens with Truman in terms of communication himself is that similarly to his civil rights policy in a way, he evolves over time. And so in his early campaigns in the summer, he does kind of a test run uh, in, in June and he goes out west to California and they don't really dub it a campaign trip, but it's kind of a test run and he does very scripted speeches and they don't always go over that well and the crowds are not all that great. But when we get to the latter part of June, the campaign advisors notice something because Truman kind of goes off the cuff and starts to talk um, a little bit more impromptu and a little bit more directly to the audience and they encourage him to continue that. And so when the campaign picks up again in the early part of September, it's much more um, that kind of approach. Now he does have a good strategy team. So on the train with him, or as a team of advisors, and as they plan out the next day's campaign, they look at where he's going to do the research about that community, things of interest to that community, and they plug that into his speeches as he arrives into a new town. He might talk about the corn prices, as we mentioned, if it's a farm state, he's gonna talk about that. So he tailors his speeches, and he's got four or five advisors who are doing the research on all of those towns as he pulls into them. So it's, they don't have Google, right? So they're having to do some phone calls and research and looking at the newspapers and figuring out from the local people on the ground, what are the important issues in those communities? And they really pull that off. Margaret was a huge hit. This is a wonderful photograph of her. Um, she's a born, like, like I said, she's born in February of 1924. So in 1948, she's in her mid-20s, and she's a very popular figure on the campaign trail. And so she doesn't, again, really have much of a speaking part, but he always introduces both Bess and Margaret when they're available. And she's a real hit with the crowd. So that comes across just being that everyday person. And then, as I mentioned, the crowds begin to get that momentum. You saw some crowds from... Elizabeth presentation and we have tons of these photographs on our website and you can search them by the date search them by the location if you want to look at campaign addresses in your state you can surely find them unless you live in the south where he does not campaign much at all uh, east of Texas and west of Florida those two states he does campaign in fairly heavily but what happens with these crowds is that they start to build in momentum um, there's a new book out by A.J. Baum that just came out this summer. And if I have a chance, I'll wave it at you on the video when I finished sharing the screen, which talks about momentum. That's one of his a thesis that he has in his latest book on the 48 campaign is this idea of momentum. So the crowds are building and building, which the pollsters don't pick up. And I love this quote from the Kansas City Times, where it talks about his communication, which is our theme for today. There's no elaborate curtain, it says. The communication was immediate and direct. It's interesting they talked about the amplifying equipment. I hadn't thought about that until Elizabeth mentioned earlier that they couldn't hear Hoover from the back of the train. Truman's team were on that and they had the amplifying equipment. They had the speakers set up so that people could hear them. And then, as I said, he then went into the towns themselves into the auditoriums, into the public squares, into the ballparks to make addresses at closer quarters. There was a lot of yelling back and forth in this kind of nature of a performance and communication. So not so much heckling, but as I mentioned the other day, when they would say things like, 
give them hell, Harry. And he said, I'm giving them hell. You know, I'm just telling them the truth. They think it's hell and comments like that, that really got the energy up and the momentum up and those um, off the cuff energetic style built and built um, through September and October. And as I mentioned, he really tailored each speech to those audiences as he went on. So I like that quote compared uh, side by side with that photograph really gets across this idea of communication and his communication style. I think I've mentioned already, but he travels about 29,000 miles uh, during that whistle stop campaign. Um, Elizabeth mentioned before um, the idea of appealing to different groups. And so Truman did actually set up a women's election campaign committee headed by a woman, India Edwards. She's a fascinating figure. And she's actually one of the few people on the train that really goes along with Truman and thinks that he can win. And I just think this is a wonderful photograph of uh, the housewives for Truman is a great banner there. And this is not uncommon uh, around the country where groups of women are pulled together by the local democratic parties as they begin to target that audience after suffrage, uh, which is really what's making a difference. And uh, again, Bess, the first lady and Margaret really help with that as well. Um, there's a lot of encouragement for Eleanor Roosevelt to come in and endorse Truman. And she does, but it's very, very late in the game. It really isn't until October that she comes out publicly and uh, endorses Truman very late on in the 48 campaign. A lot of that is because everybody thought, of course, that he was gonna lose. The other target audience I mentioned yesterday uh, was African-Americans. So I'm not necessarily gonna repeat that information from yesterday, but certainly African-Americans were certainly another audience that he targeted um, due to his civil rights programs. And that's a deliberate strategy. One of the documents I put in the Google Drive is a document from 1947 in November, authored by Clark Clifford and another aide, Rowe. Uh, and those two aides um, set out this 43 page um, campaign strategy a year ahead of the election. And I'm not expecting all of your students to read all of those 43 pages, but you can pull extracts from that where they talk about appealing to the African-American vote, appealing to labor and so on. They really start to identify their target audiences within the campaign. So technology itself, some of these things, you know, are outside of Truman's control, but he tries to use them as best he can. So the numbers that I've been able to uh, figure out in 1948, obviously this number is a lot less than it is today. One in eight families has television sets in 1948. I looked around my house today uh, <laughs> here in Kansas City, and we've got three televisions in our house, and that doesn't even include the computers and the iPads and the phones that all can stream you know, live television programs. We were looking at our school board, board meeting last night, um, talking about when schools are gonna open in my local school district for my 10 year old. And that was all done on YouTube, right? So it wasn't on a local television channel. So the numbers are a lot different in 1948. But in terms of those firsts, one that we didn't include earlier, which is always a fun fact, is that Truman is the first president to have a television set in the Oval Office. And he buys that in 1948. And an interesting aside, during the Obama administration, we had a third grader going through our museum, and I'm going off track, but that's okay. This is a cool anecdote. We had a third grader from Independent School District where Truman graduated from, ask one of our volunteers, does President Obama have a, a television in the Oval Office? and we all kind of scratched our heads and didn't know the answer. He picked the right docent to ask because that docent's um, ne nephew or son-in-law or some kind of relative was, tr was a President Obama's press secretary who's from Blue Springs, Missouri. So she texted him while standing in front of the third graders and that she got a reply and was told no. President Obama did not have a television in the Oval Office, but in the room next door, they had banks of televisions tuned into TV stations all over the world. 
So you can see that transition in technology from 1948 and that conversation happened in around 2015. Obviously much more prevalent was newspaper circulation. So in 1940, 1948, it's at about 52 million and the population in 1948 was about 146 million. And we've mentioned a lot about radio and, and uh, FDR's radio addresses. And in 19, the 1940 census, so the numbers are gonna be higher by 1948, eight, almost 83% of the population owned a radio. Now, Truman though, took, he did do radio addresses, but he liked that in-person, one-on-one, -on -one, even though it's a huge crowd, those one-on-one -on -one addresses, talking to individuals and so forth. And on the big day, the biggest day of his campaign, four days before November 2nd, the election day, he travels from Massachusetts to New York State. And uh, in that day, he does 16 speeches in one day. Each speech is different. All of them are transcribed and available on the Truman Library website. You can see them under the public papers section of our website. Uh, A.J. Bain, whose book I mentioned, calculates there are more than 18,000 words in those 16 speeches. He probably used, probably copied and pasted them all into Word and did a word count. That's the only thing I can think he did. And no speeches repeated. And this photograph is from that day, early in the morning. He's in Brockton, Brockton Massachusetts, and he ends the day uh, in the Bronx in New York City. So quite an amazing day of the campaigns, and it was a very grueling campaign. Um, I'm not going to do this activity right now, but we're going to be sharing this PowerPoint. This is a great activity that I do with students, and this is the Norman Rockwell painting that we have in our museum collection. It's currently in Omaha receiving preservation treatment, and it will be part of our new museum renovation when we reopen in October or November of this year. But I like to do this dialogue with Speaker A, where he's pointing at Dewey and the housewife who's pouting and holding a newspaper, supporting Truman. But it's a wonderful activity and you can see the date on the Saturday evening post of October 30th, 1948. Um, and I can certainly share the link to that picture when I get done with my presentation here. And it's actually on a lesson plan that I'm gonna share the whole lesson plan to you here in a moment. With that, I'm gonna race through. I'm not gonna talk about this political cartoon. Let me get to the results we talked about yesterday, but they also won the Senate and the House on the Democratic side. So it's a clean sweep for the Democrats. I'm gonna go through the winning and losing and get to this. Here's the link to the lesson plans and Truman Library on YouTube. Uh, if you just go to trumanlibrary.gov and go to the bottom of the page, you can click on the YouTube link. And part of that is a color footage of the 1948 campaign. It's about an hour long and it's uh, silent. So it's not super exciting, but it is in color. And it's been digitized in the year 2020 during the shutdown. We got that footage digitized for the first time. So that's pretty exciting that you can see some of the color footage. You can see Truman fishing. You can see Truman walking in parades, wonderful stuff like that, that you can see. And then the lesson plans that I mentioned that includes um, that 1948 um, poster painting by Norman Rockwell is in there too. So with that, I'm gonna stop my sharing. I'm gonna show you a couple of things. One is, the, I feel like Jeff now, one is the book Dewey Defeats Truman by A.J. Bain. Wonderful um, new publication on the election. The other is my replica of the famous newspaper. It, I'm not touching one of our original artifacts. The Dewey Defeats Truman, which is always fun to talk about with students as well. So with that, uh, the next up in our chronology is Mira. And you're muted, Mira. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Wish me luck. Okay, great. Uh, here we go. So, um, 
In talking about uh, Ronald Reagan and campaign communications, I think it's important to go back just a little bit and discuss how masterful Ronald Reagan really was with all forms of technology. So uh, let's take a look here. When he graduated college, he said he wanted to be a movie star. And a famous quote to say, I wanted to be a movie star would have been as eccentric as saying, I wanted to go to the moon. But I had an idea to start in radio. Remember, he's from a small town in Illinois. Um, he did not start out from a typical Hollywood family, although he ultimately created a quintessential Hollywood family. And he ended up getting his very first job in radio in Davenport, Iowa. And he was hired after he improvised a play-by-play -play commentary of an imaginary football game. By uh, 1933 and, and until 1937, he moved up to a larger radio station where he was known as Dutch Reagan as a sports announcer. So he's getting his handle really early on in his career in terms of becoming very creative, very nimble, very adept, and very used to speaking using technological media, the technological media at the time, remember, uh, as Jeff or uh, Elizabeth might tell you, this was very much the heart of the Great Depression, and he's really successful using the new technology, the new communication, or the height of the communication mechanisms at the time. He moves on uh, to work in film. He's contracted by Warner Brothers in 1937. This is a Warner Brothers poster for Newt Rockne, one of his uh, major films. Interestingly, I had an opportunity to go to Warner Brothers uh, a few years ago, and they had walls of these movie posters just dedicated to Ronald Reagan. He had been in 19 films during his tenure um, at Warner Brothers. Uh, in just a really short period of time, between 37 and 39, been in 19 roles. Uh, most of these were what were called B movies. Uh, they weren't meant necessarily to be award winning, although King's Row ultimately was nominated for the best picture in 1943. They were meant to just be put out to the American public really quickly. And again, masterful in front of the movie camera. Here he is, he moves then into television. And he masters this new small screen where he's um, bringing television starting in 1954 for eight years through the GE Theater, General Electric Theater, to many, many Americans across the entire country. As part of this role, he visits 139 factories in 39 states. And he ends up giving short talks on the factory floor in front of the company workers. And this is where he really begins to hone these skills. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we know he also becomes the head of the Screen Actors Guild, and he also becomes governor of California. But this is where he really hones his skills of talking to regular Americans multiple audiences in multiple groups. And he starts, he had been a Democrat, FDR had been one of his heroes. And he begins more and more to start talking about some of the pillars of what later becomes his presidential campaign. The importance of taking initiative, the perils of big government, and the strength of private enterprise. And of course, he's working for a major American corporation. Very charismatic, but yet very personable. Um, by the time we get to the 1980 campaign, and obviously moving very quickly through all of this, by the time we get to the 1980 campaign, he has mastered the radio, he has mastered working with film, and he has mastered working with television. And based off of what we were talking about yesterday with the 1980 campaign, he asked this important question in one of the debates, 
Are you better off today than you were four years ago? Are you better off today? He comes to echo this theme later on in the 1984 campaign. But let's take a look at how well versed he is in speaking to a camera, in managing an audience, but at the same time, just like some of the others have spoken to today, making you feel like he is talking directly to you personally. Next Tuesday is election day. Next Tuesday, all of you will go to the polls, will stand there in the polling place and make a decision. I think when you make that decision, it might be well if you would ask yourself, are you better off than you were four years ago? Is it easier for you to go and buy things in the stores than it was four years ago? Is there more or less unemployment in the country than there was four years ago? Is America as respected throughout the world as it was? Do you feel that our security is as safe, that we're as strong as we were four years ago? And if you answer all of those questions, yes, why then I think your choice is very obvious as to who you'll vote for. If you don't agree, if you don't think that this course that we've been on for the last four years is what you would like to see us follow for the next four, then I could suggest another choice that you have. This country doesn't have to be in the shape that it is in. We do not have to go down, go on sharing in scarcity with uh, the country getting worse off, with unemployment growing. We talk about the unemployment lines. If all of the unemployed today were in a single line, allowing two feet for each one of them, that line would reach from New York City to Los Angeles, California. All of this can be cured and all of it can be solved. I have not had the experience that the president has had in holding that office, but I think in being governor of California, the most populous state in the union, if it were a nation, it would be the seventh ranking economic power in the world. I too had some lonely moments and decisions to make. I know that the economic program that I have proposed for this nation in the next few years can resolve many of the problems that trouble. Okay, so I'm going to stop it there, but I want you to see how this theme of are you better off actually is carried through to the 1984 campaign, which I think is really pretty cool. Um, by the way, I want to add that uh, the state of California would actually be the fifth largest economy today uh, rather than the seventh in 1980. Um, in 1984, President Reagan and his team really carry forward this idea of economic well-being. And rather than us uh, expecting Americans to answer no to the question, are you better off today than the, you were four years ago? The team is hoping that Americans, of course, with Ronald Reagan as the incumbent, will answer yes to the question, are you better off today than you were four years ago? So the Tuesday team uh, is a group of New York um, advertisers working on what ultimately is meant to appeal to a multiplicity of Americans, many living not necessarily in New York, um, Midwesterners, Southerners, uh, and evoking this sense of this idyllic America. And they're hoping that, that voters will imagine themselves living in this idyllic world that has of course been created by president and candidate Ronald Reagan. So as you can see here, there's a very specific strategy created. The overall creative plan is to isolate key national issues and develop single-minded commercials to be aimed at key constituents and target groups. Here are the objectives, one to four, almost like they're writing a lesson plan, right? To convince the target audience that the Reagan administration's performance on each of the key issues has affected significant positive strain, uh, change. To strengthen among soft Democrats and independents and reinforce among soft Republicans voter confidence. To preempt and diffuse the current and anticipated Democratic attack strategies and to convince target audiences that the positive performance of the past four years 
is a precursor of even greater accomplishments in the future. So we're gonna look at in just a moment is the very famous, and it's known as one of the quintessential, one of the best campaign ads of all time, um, prouder, stronger, better. Okay, so we have additional paperwork from the archives about the making of this ad, but I'll be sharing this entire PowerPoint uh, with you in the folder. Uh, by the end of today, I put the last two in yesterday. Prouder, stronger, better, you might know this better as Morning in America. And I'd like you to think while you're watching this, if you're an American watching this, are you thinking that you are better off today than you were four years ago? We're looking for a yes answer. You were formed by the heat Oops. of the galaxy. All right, seems that we have an what ad. Thing to be. Here we go. It's morning again in America. Day. More men and women will go to work than ever before in our country's history. With interest rates at about half the record highs of 1980, nearly 2,000 families today will buy new homes, more than at any time in the past four years. This afternoon, 6,500 young men and women will be married. And with inflation at less than half of what it was just four years ago, they can look forward with confidence to the future. It's morning again in America, and under the leadership of President Reagan, our country is prouder and stronger and better. Why would we ever want to return to where we were less than four short years ago? Okay, so this is a very uh, warm, fuzzy, sunny, patriotic, feel-good advertisement. And I'm hoping you were thinking that, yes, you felt very good about being an American, or if you were an American, I know not everybody's American here, um, you would have felt good about that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna end here, but very quickly, in the interest of time, I had said we'd answer your questions, but we all talked a whole bunch. So if you have any questions, go ahead, write them in the chat box. And while Kathleen is talking, um, I will catalog them and figure out somehow in the next 10 minutes the best way for all of us to respond to you. It might be by email um, or it might be in the folder um, written out for a later time so that Kathleen gets her full time. So I'm going to pass it over to Kathleen. Kathleen, you there? Kathleen, are you, you're on mute. Kathleen, okay. No, I'm here. I'm oh, here. Okay. <laughs> you know, when you have like 12 windows open on your computer, it's hard to get back to back to the one. Um, so. I want to share some stuff with you guys today. I am going to show you a couple of videos. I'm trying to keep them short so that we will have time for questions at the end. And I know that um, it's it's been a whirlwind pace, but I think the important takeaway um, from today, yesterday, and Tuesday is that we work for you. We are all federal employees. So we are available to you, email, phone call, um, you know, we. We want to help you, we want to help your students, and we want to do that any way that we can. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. We've got okay, a couple of new share screen. Let's go there. All right, and we'll do that from the start. So what you're going to see, and hopefully you're looking at something that says President Clinton campaign communications, everything old is new again. Yes. Yep. Yes. Got it. Thank you. I didn't want to repeat my mistake of yesterday. Although I do like to make the same mistake three or four times just to make sure I'm doing it right. Um, okay. So what you're going to see is President Clinton did some things that were very different from previous candidates. And then he did some things that were very similar to previous candidates. 
So one of the things that Clinton did that was very different for the time, and it's hard to imagine right now how actually how groundbreaking it was, um, but he went on the Arsenio Hall show, and then he also went on an MTV show, brand new, they just created it. I'll tell you a little bit about that when we, on the next slide, um, MTV Choose or Lose, which when I started doing research on this, I was searching for Rock the Boat. So Rock the Boat and Choose or Lose were actually two different programs, but both designed by the music industry to, as a little bit of a pushback against Tipper Gore and the Parents Music Resource Council. So I'm gonna pull out of this. I'm not gonna try and show you. Um, da, da, da. Okay, can you see Arsenio Hall now? Jeff, can you nod your head? Yeah, he's kind of off to the side. Yeah, well, and mine is on the top. Okay, so let me know if you can't hear this. You now should I be able to go hear this. Way back to 1992, the year Nirvana's Nevermind went number one on the U.S. Billboard 200 charts. Sinead O'Connor stirred up controversy by ripping a picture of the Pope on Saturday Night Live. You remember that? And right, so Bill this is Arsenio Hall George reflecting the on this moment. Election. But before all that happened, this happened on my show. <sighs> That was then Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton belting out a soulful rendition of Heartbreak Hotel on my show, the Arsenio Hall show, that changed presidential campaigning forever. Uh, now, he played the sax, and people say it changed things forever, but I don't want to be the one saying that. So I got Mr. John King, CNN's John King here, and we're going to talk about that memorable time. And John, if you're there, let, let's, let's discuss how it changed things. Do you think it changed politics forever? Uh, without a doubt, it changed politics forever. Remember, uh, Clinton was in a lot of trouble that year. There were a lot of character questions. It was also a fascinating, unusual presidential race. Ross Perot was a factor in that race as well. So what was the challenge? Uh, number one, for Bill Clinton to expand the definition of his personality when there were a lot of character questions and other questions about whether this guy from Arkansas was ready to do this. Number two, the challenge was reach out to try to get new voters. Perot was... Okay, so what happens there is... Um... Uh, goes on to say Perot was bringing in new voters and Clinton was looking to bring in new voters. So going on the Arsenio Hall show was one way to do that. But then President Clinton took it a step further and appeared on MTV. It was actually called Facing the Future. And to be clear, um, candidate Clinton was invited, candidate Ross Perot was invited, the incumbent president, George H.W. Bush, was invited. Clinton is the only one who showed. And what happened with this is they recruited an audience. Um, they had Tabitha Soren. Um, she was kind of a news anchor with Kurt Loder um, on MTV at the time. It's, it's hard to imagine because this is when MTV actually showed music videos. Um, originally, it was scheduled to be an hour. It ended up they ended up making it a 90 minute special. And what happens is they air it like, well, like 12 times a day, not 12 times a day, but they air it, um, you know, they continue to air it and air it and people are watching this. And these are young people who maybe are not engaged with the, with the elections process. All right, and I apologize, this video is a little grainy. Um, we don't have very many assets in our collection that are from the campaign. Presidential libraries sometimes face a disadvantage. Um, I can show you a ton of stuff from 1996 because President Clinton was president when he was doing all of it, but as a candidate prior to winning, um, it's a little finer, harder to find those sources. 
to Facing the Future with Bill Clinton. There are many people here that still haven't gotten a chance to ask a question. We're almost out of time. So we're going to start a rapid round of questioning now. Sort of have some fun with short questions that can be answered with short answers or even just a yes or no. What's your question for the governor? If you had it to do over again, would you inhale? <laughs> Sure, if I could, I tried before. <laughs> Governor Clinton, who did you believe, Clarence Thomas or Anita Hill? Anita Hill. Agree or disagree with warning labels on record albums? I think for them to do it on a voluntary basis for really young kids is, is a good thing to do. I don't favor a, a mandatory labeling, but I think for the industry to do it the way they've done with the movies is a plus. I think the industry should do it the way they've done it with the movies. I don't think it should be mandated. Do you personally personally participate in recycling? Yes. On an astrological note, what's your sign? Leo. What was the first presidential election you participated in and who did you vote for? I voted for McGovern in 72. I was old enough to vote for Humphrey, but my absentee ballot didn't come back from the courthouse in time for me to cast it. I would have voted for Humphrey in 68. What was your first rock and roll experience? Oh, uh, going nuts over Elvis Presley. Okay, so coming back, coming back to that. So, so I know we are running out of time. Oh, two minutes. Okay. Um, I want to, yep, this is where I want to be. Can you see my PowerPoint again? Yes, okay. Um, so I will share this with everyone. It's got the links. It's got the link to the clip I showed you about Arsenio Hall reflecting on Clinton being on his show, but I also encourage you to watch this eight minute interview that the bottom link is. It's it's not President Clinton playing. It's, it's Arsenio Hall asking him some questions. And the like the first question is again about smoking marijuana. Um, the MTV thing is very interesting. You'll notice that Clinton seems completely at ease. Um, just want to point out Clinton is the first baby boomer, right? So he's the first president that's not a World War II veteran, right? So that's significant. We're seeing a shift there. Very quickly, I just want to show you, we, we see these changes, but you know, the more things change, the more things stay the same. So, we see um, Clinton riding around on a bus with Al Gore from factory to farm in 1992. They bring the bus back. It gets a new uh, title on the road to the 21st century. And they're, they're out there in the crowds. And then trains, trains, look at that express the express to the 21st century and you'll see these giant crowds so this is not that different from what we saw with hoover from what we saw with truman and oh that last picture didn't get in there so i'm going to escape this and i want to end on I'll just open it up out All right, let's let's take questions while I find this photo, because you need to see it. Questions, thoughts, comments, snide remarks. I put some of the questions in. There were only two significant questions coming in. One had to do with, did you think your candidate's campaign overall was positive and forward looking or negative? Hmm. Huh. Uh, Truman's was a mixture of that, if I can pipe in, in that he was negative towards the 80th Congress, but he was positive in the sense of he would let, if they would pass my legislation, we can get some things done. So it was forward thinking in the terms of I've got these things I want to do, but the Republican, the 80th Congress is blocking me from doing them. So it was kind of a mixed bag in that sense. Yeah, but he didn't attack, but he did not attack Dewey hardly at all, which was interesting. I would say they're both very positive, um, especially given 
the, the crises he was facing, the Great Depression and, and the Second World War. I mean, the idea was get to a better place. And, um, you know, I've got some ideas on how to get there. Yeah. Reagan was very specific in not wanting to be negative. He attacked the um, policies. Uh, he tried very hard not to attack the candidate. All right, Kathleen, do you have that one that was commercial? Because we're out of time. You want to just the photo? I just wanted you guys to see this photo. I did get it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. very nice. Because when Mark was like, oh, you know, Truman and, and Bess, <laughs> and, and I'm like, wait, 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 I wait, have this photo. Yeah. Put them side, we need to put them side by side now. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, That's absolutely. How old, is she, how, old is, how old is Chelsea that she's so this, younger so than Margaret? This is the 1996 campaign. Uh -huh. So she's like 12 in 1992. So, 16. so she's 16. Okay. That's funny. She's 16. Yeah. She basically grew up in the White House. Um, okay. Born in, in 1980. So she's 12 in 1992. Um, and then she's, you know, she leaves before the end of his second term because she's 20 by the time that he leaves office. Be curious to see the Obama campaign photos with his two daughters. Oh, I'm, I'm sure they're fabulous. Oh. I'm sure they're fabulous. That's very so, interesting. Well, thanks everybody. Thank you so much. We'll get those certificates out to you by email. Um, really appreciate it. If you could go into the folder uh, that Elizabeth had prepared and share your email information, I'll make it a lot easier to get to you. If you want to write me directly, um, here I am. Uh, but we're going to be pretty much working off the, fo the uh, email information off the folder. Thanks again, everyone. Have a hey, great everybody. week. There's the train at night. <laughs> Clinton and Chelsea again. Thank you for that comment, Lorna. That's very kind of you. All right. Bye, y'all. Bye.